Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the anatomy of uh, the scalp and face. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Dadia Saleh, professor and head of anatomy department, Manpura University. The objective of the first part of the presentation is about the scalp. I'm gonna cover the following. Um, first, we'll talk about the layers, and we will focus on the muscle, the only muscle there, which is the occipital frontalis muscle. And then we'll talk about its nerve supply, uh, sensory and motor, and the blood supply, including the arterial supply, the venous drainage, and uh, the lymphatic drainage as well. Starting with the layers of the scalp, and uh, the scalp is made of five layers, and it is made of five letters. Uh, the S stands for the skin, the C stands for the connective tissue layer, A for aponeurosis, L for loose areolar tissue, and T for pericranium. So these are the five letters uh, composing the word scalp and it's formed of five layers from superficial to deep, skin, connective tissue, aponeurosis, loose areolar tissue, and pericranium. Uh, in this diagram, we, uh, it can show you the layers. The superficial one is the skin. Deep to it lies the connective tissue layer. Deep to it lies the aponeurotic layer, including the occipital frontalis muscle. And deep to it lies the loose areolar tissue, or loose connective tissue. And the fifth layer will be pericranium close to the skull bone. For the skin, um, as you can see, it is uh, thick and hairy. It contains numerous specious glands, and of course, you know that the specious glands uh, opens into the hair follicles. Next, we have the connective tissue layer here beneath the skin. It's a fibro fatty layer characterized by the following it contains fibrous septa uniting the skin layer above it to the underlying aponeurotic layer. That's why the, these three layers move as one because of these five receptors. Also it contains many nerves, okay, many arteries and veins are found here in this uh, subcutaneous tissue. Um, the third layer is the aponeurosis of the occipital frontalis muscle. It is a thin tendinous sheet. It unites both the frontal bilis and the occipital bilis of the uh, occipital frontalis muscle together. On the lateral side, on the lateral side, it is attached to the temporal fascia or the fascia over the temporalis muscle or the muscle filling this uh, region of the skull, which is called the temple or the side of the skull. Uh, the fourth layer here is called the loose area tissue. It loosely connects the aponeurosis to the pericranium and thus allows the movement of the upper three layers and the gliding over the pericranium. It contains few uh, amounts of uh, small arteries and emissary. So what are the emissary veins? The emissary veins, um, these are the emissary veins here. They connect the veins in the scalp to the diploid veins or the veins that lie within the skull bone. Also, it connects them to the inside of the skull or to the dural vena sinus. So, the emissary veins can transmit infection from the outside, from the scalp, down to the veins inside the, uh, the brain the, or the dural vena sinus. The last layer or the fifth layer is called the pericranium and uh, the pericranium is equivalent to the periosteum that covers the outer surface of the skull bone. Uh, the pericranium is continuous with the endosteum on the un inner surface of the skull bone through the pony centers here.
The muscle that is present in the scalp, the only muscle that is present in the scalp is called the occipital frontalis muscle. And from its name, it's made of two pillars, uh, one on the front, it's called the frontal pillars, and uh, two on the back, they are called the occipital pillars. Uh, the origin, uh, the only pony origin is for the occipital pillars, they arise from the height nuchal line. What's meant by the nuchal? Nuchal line. The nuchae is the back of the neck. So the nuchal line is the limitation or the boundary between the scalp and the back of the neck. So the occipital bullet, as we can see from this diagram, arise from the high nuchal line. The frontal uh, pillars, however, they do not have any attachment. They are attached to the skin and the superficial, uh, superficial fascia of the eye tract here. Insertion of both pillars, they are inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis uh, or the galea aponeurosis. For the nerve supply of occipital frontalis, uh, it will be supplied by branches from the facial nerve, same like the other facial muscles. Uh, for the action, um, you know that the, uh, we have two pillars, occipital belly and frontal belly. The occipital belly is the one that is attached to the bone, so it will be the fixed part. While the frontal belly, because of its attachment to the skin of the eyebrows, it will raise the eyebrows upward, like this. You look, uh, if you look at the uh, diagram on the left, you can see the frontal belly of occipital frontalis, and when they contract, they will pull the skin of the eyebrow upward, leading to horizontal wrinkling of the forehead, as in surprise. Now to the nerve supply of the scalp. I know it is a little bit hard for you to recall all the names, but simply. Uh, there are 10 nerves that supply the scalp, 5 in front of the auricle and 5 behind the auricle. The 5 in front of the auricle uh, would be further divided into 4 sensory and 1 motor. First motor would be one of the branches of the facial nerve, while the 4 sensory nerves in front of the auricle, we have the supracochlear and supraorbital nerves from the ophthalmic. We have the zygomatical temporal from the maxillary nerve. And we have the auricular tumbral uh, from the mandibular nerve. Um, still, we have five branches behind the auricle, one motor and four sensory. Again, the motor will be one of the branches of the facial nerve, while the sensory, we have two of them just behind the auricle, originate or comes from the cervical plexus. We have the great auricular and the lesser occipital. And then we have um, at the very back, we have the great occipital and the third occipital, and they are direct branches from the posterior rami of the cer cervical nerves. Um, they will be more easy here in this diagram. So again, we are looking to the uh, scalp here, and this is the auricle or the ear. We have five branches in front of the auricle and five branches behind the auricle. From each of the five branches, one is motor, which is branch of the facial nerve, and the other four are sensory. Just the abo above the eye, we have the supratrochlear and supraorbital nerve. They both arise from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The supratrochlear is medial and it is small, it reaches just till the level of the hairline. While the supraorbital is a little bit larger or bigger, and it will travel from the forehead up to the vertex. And uh, what we mean by the vertex is the highest point here at the top of the skull. Then we have two branches. One comes from the maxillary nerve, which is called the zygomatic temporal nerve. It will supply a small area at the anterior uh, part of the temple. And a bigger one comes from uh, the mandibular nerve, it's called auriculotemporal nerve, it will supply the posterior part of the temple. Behind the auricle, like I said, uh, just behind the auricle, 
we have two branches coming from or arising from the cervical plexus plexus of nerves that lies here in the posterior triangle we have the great auricular nerve and the lesser occipital nerve they both will supply small area behind the auricle here at the very back or, or at the posterior aspect of the uh, scalp we have the great occipital nerve here a very large nerve that arises directly from the posterior ramus of the second cervical uh, nerve and it will supply the back of the scalp up to the wrist here and the smaller one is called a third occipital nerve the third occipital comes from the third uh, cervical nerve posterior ramus of third cervical nerve and it will supply a small area here over the occiput or the back of the occipital nerve For the blood supply, we have uh, th five branches, three in front of the auricle and two behind the auricle. The three in front of the auricle, we have again the suprascopular and supraorbital arteries arise from the ophthalmic uh, branch of the internal carotid artery. And the third one is the superficial temporal. It is one of the two terminal branches of the external carotid arch. The two behind the auricle are the posterior auricular and the occipital arches, and they both arise from the external carotid arch. Here you can see this diagram. This is the external carotid artery here. It gives many branches. From the front of it, we have the facial, the lingual, and the, the superior thyroid. From its back, we have the uh, posterior auricular here, just behind the auricle, and the occipital, which grooves its way over the occipital blood. The external carotid uh, artery itself uh, passes upward, and at the level of the neck of the mandible, it splits or divides into superficial, temporal, and maxillary uh, branches. However, uh, from the ophthalmic artery, from inside the orbit, comes two terminal branches of it. We have the suprasocular, and just like it lies the supraorbital artery. So again, if we assume that this is the auricle here, so we have three branches in front of the auricle: the suprasocular, the supraorbital, and the big one here is the superficial temporal artery. Behind the auricle, we have the posterior auricular and the occipital artery. Uh, if we look to the scalp from a top view, this is the front, this is, there is the nose here, this is the back, and this is the auricle. So again, we have three branches in front of the auricle. From medial to lateral, we have the suprasocular, supraorbital artery, and just in front of the auricle, we have the superficial temporal artery. Behind the auricle, we have the posterior auricular, and at the back, we have the occipital artery. And the scalp is one of the areas where branches from the external carotid artery communicate with branches from the internal carotid artery through communication between the suprasocular, supraorbital, and the three branches coming from the external carotid artery. For the venous drainage of the scalp, we have um, many veins. Uh, we will we'll start with this one. We have, of course, the distic vein at the side of the scalp, which is called the superficial temporal vein. It will unite when, with another one behind the neck of the mandible. It's called the maxillary vein. And they will both form the retro mandibular vein. Retro means behind, and mand mandibular vein means that the vein that lies behind the mandible. At the angle of the mandible, it will split into two branches or two divisions, anterior division and posterior division. Then, at the front, we have the facial vein, which is formed near the angle of the eye by union of the two uh, small veins here, the suprasocular and the supraorbital vein. The facial vein just passes obliquely uh, in the face and uh, 
um, it will unite with the anterior division of the lateral mandibular vein and together will form this common facial vein that will empty into the internal jugular vein, this big red vein at the neck. From the back, we have the posterior auricular vein that is behind the auricle or the ear. It will uh, unite with the posterior division of the lateral mandibular vein and together they will form the external jugular vein and the external jugular vein will pass downward and reach the root of the neck and empty into the subclavian vein. And for the lymphatic drainage, simply the lymphatic drainage follows the pattern of the arterial distribution. So at the occipital region or at the very back of the scalp, we have the occipital nose. Behind the ear, we have the posterior auricular or motoi nose. And anterior to the ear, we have the pre auricular and the carotid nose. So if you look at this diagram, again this is the ear. At the back, the area of the scalp at the occipital region will drain into the occipital nose. The area of the scalp behind the auricle will um, drain to the matoid or the posterior auricular nose. And the area of the scalp in front of the ear will drain into the carotid and the pre-auricular nose.